is Dr. Dharma Singh Khalsa, President and Medical Director of the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation, and we're thrilled today to have uh, number one New York Times bestselling author, Dr. David Perlmutter. The book is called Grain Brain. It's fantastic. And before we get started with Dr. Perlmutter, two things. Number one, uh, we have well over 300 people on the call here today, and many of you have been kind enough to give us donations, so we appreciate that. If you'd like to give a donation to help us continue our nonprofit research, it's alzheimersprevention.org, and there's a little connection there for you to do that. And to go to, to get a free book called the Hidden Glycemic Index Book, it's to go to uh, sign up for Dr. Perlmutter's email community. You simply go to www.drperlmutter, D-R-P-E-R-L, M-U-T-T-E-R dot com, Dr. dot com, and a red pop-up will come up there, and you just put in your information, your e- your email, and you will get that book. It's a, I got one. It's about 20 pages long, and it really is excellent, answers a lot of questions, and it's helped me already, and I just got it today. And uh, so, welcome, Dr. Perlmutter. It's a great honor to have you on the show today. Well, it is my honor to be here, and and I think for your listeners to know, uh, you and I have known each other for a long, long time, and I so honor your dedication and everything that you're about. Big problem. It's a heart-wrenching problem. I'm going through it personally with a family member, and and I'm totally appreciative of everything you're doing. Well, thank you so much, and I just want to tell everybody that I saw you on Dr. Oz today, and you were fantastic. And I uh, really loved when he put the hot water, whatever that was, on the brain. <laughs> well, yeah. He was, we were trying to show disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And right. the brain was covered with glass. And it's this Hollywood glass that breaks when it's heated. And I have to tell you, I, I jumped back a bit. It was kind of spooky. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, well, just uh, one final thing. is uh, Dr. Perlmutter has sold 480,000 books so far, which is, I mean, beyond awesome. And it's phenomenal. And you just told me and just shared with me that you you have a new book now with Tracy Behart, Little Brown, and what will that book be about? Can you tell us? Uh, well, <laughs> you'll probably learn what it's about as our conversation proceeds. It's like, all right. with, all, with all due respect in my heart, I'm duty bound not to reveal all right. that. Otherwise, all right. you know, I hear you. More naked. Well, you heard it first here anyway, ladies and gentlemen. He does have a new book coming out. And Actually, the Green Brain. You know what? I can say I do have a new book coming out. Yes, I have a the Grain Brain Cookbook will be launched oh. on September the fifteenth of this year. So there you go. There you go. All right, fantastic. All right, so let's go to the Grain Brain book, number one New York Times bestseller. And my question for you, I mean, is how or why did you decide to write this book? What what made you do this? And someone I have to tell you, someone wrote in the first email I got was someone saying, "Well, is there science behind it?" So let's start with that. Why did you decide to write this book? And tell us a little bit about the science behind it. I decided to uh, write a book that would bring the latest, leading edge, most well respected, peer reviewed science that deals with the idea of preventing Alzheimer's to the public awareness. I mean, we have 5.4 million Alzheimer's patients in America today, and our best research, which was what went into writing Grain Brain, more than 200 peer-reviewed research uh, citations, is indicating that, yes, as a matter of fact, the very lifestyle choices we make play a huge role in determining the destiny of the brain and absolutely can flip the coin as to whether uh, we end up with Alzheimer's or we don't. So... To very specifically answer that email, uh, this is about hitting the ball back over the net to the to the reader side of the court, empowering the reader with information now to make the lifestyle changes and not be at the mercy uh, of a situation where you're hoping that medical science is going to come up for a cure for a disease that we know is preventable. Wow. Well, that's phenomenal. And as we both know right now, there is no drug that has any meaningful impact on Alzheimer's prevention or curative. So anything that we can do to prevent it, as you're talking about the diet, I'd like to get into that a little more. Plus, of course, uh, there's exercise and meditation yoga that we talk about, we do research on. And then, you know, uh, things that enhance a person's spiritual and psychological well-being. 
So I don't exactly know where to start, so I'm going to start with the, what I saw today on the Dr. Oz show. You presented a male patient with a movement disorder and a female patient who you had on there with you on the show with severe spasm, almost like she had had a stroke, and they both were healed and cured of this, and it's not any kind of funny business. They really were, and what did you do for them that made them become normal? Dharma, the fundamental of many brain disorders, and certainly Alzheimer's, and what we discovered as it was with these two patients I presented on the program today, is inflammation. Just as sure as your knee becomes inflamed with arthritis, or you are inflamed when you're bitten by a bumblebee or honeybee, inflammation is the cornerstone of everything bad in your brain that you don't want to get. And it became clear to me with both of these individuals, a 23-year-old young man with uh, myoclonus where his muscles were jumping all over and he was told he needed mm-hmm. Botox. And the woman Whoa. with what is called hemifacial spasm, where half of her face was, as you well said, contorted. Uh, there were other aspects of their histories that clued me in that something else could be going on. Headaches, uh, bowel disorders, difficulty performing in school. So I put them both, as I normally do now virtually all my patients, on a gluten-free diet And those devastating, irreversible problems were, in fact, reversible and went away. Now, I brought one patient on the program with me. We showed her before video, and there she was in living color after video, Mm -hmm. simply going gluten-free. So it takes us back, I think, to to the notion of our lifestyle choices being so important as they relate to brain health. And I think the big fundamental for this evening's conference Uh, is that uh, inflammation is brought on by carbohydrates and their role in raising blood sugar. That is the the fundamental concept of of this evening. Let's make it so. And and why do I say that? Why is that one of the fundamental tenets of of grain brain? And where is the science uh, vis-a-vis the uh, email that you received? Well, let's look, for example, at the New England Journal of Medicine, very uh, well-respected medical journal, August 8, 2013, not even a year ago, published a compelling article indicating that even subtle elevations of blood sugar, like 105, where your doctor is going to give you a pat on the back and say, don't worry about it, these levels of blood sugar are already directly related with future increased risk for becoming a demented person. As you so well stated, that is a situation for which there is no meaningful treatment. And yet... Our most well-respected, arguably the most well-respected medical journal on the planet, is telling us that subtle elevations of blood sugar translate to risk, higher risk for dementia. So, the take-home message is, you've got to do everything you can to lower your blood sugar, and that means you've got to cut carbohydrates from your diet and increase your consumption of fat. So, I am crystal clear to your listeners, what I just said was, We've got to eat more fat. That's what the brain is desperate for. Now, again, vis-a-vis the original email, what's the science that supports that? Well, the Mayo Clinic, publishing in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in January of 2012, made it very clear that those individuals who have higher levels of carbohydrates in their diet in this study demonstrated an 88% increased risk of becoming demented. In contrast... 88%? 88% increased risk. In wow. contrast, those whose diets favored higher amounts of fat, whose risk was reduced by 46%. Again, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, 2012. Right. For those who need the reference, volume 32, page 329. That's <laughs> as good as it gets. We talk about validating our statements with peer-reviewed science, and that's what this book is all about. It's not like you and I are talking about things that we have hunches about. This is real. You know, your risk of becoming an Alzheimer's patient if you live to be age 85 in America Mm -hmm. is 50-50. And when you gain weight, when you become diabetic, when you favor carbs in your diet, when you don't have adequate amounts of healthful fats, you dramatically increase that risk and that's your mission in life, and, and that's why we're having this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Dr. David Perlmutter. 
author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain, and he's just made a very, I don't know, striking statement saying that it's the carbs. It's, you know, the, the we've heard so much about the low-carb diet. Is that what we should be following? If a high carb, if the high sugar, I mean, are all carbs bad? And when you say high fat, what exactly do you mean in the diet? Uh, I heard you say today on the show, Dr. Oz, where you were on, did a great job. You said, butter is back, and I really heard that. And so uh, is that what you mean? And when you say high fat, can we eat protein as well? And and uh, well, what, these, are, what are, these are excellent questions. And I, I'm just to, to, you know, to be so crystal clear, we have to understand what that means, being on a high-fat diet. Because if you're starting to eat the, tr- the damaged fats, the modified fats that have been made, they extend, it extends their shelf life, trans fats that are so devastating, um, these in- absolutely are risky for health and bad things for your health. Now, I mentioned earlier the importance of inflammation mechanistically in terms of damaging the brain. Certain fats are clearly related with increased risk of inflammation that lead to inflammation, and these are what we call the Mm omega-6s. Unfortunately, the American diet is very, very uh, enriched with these omega-6s, things like corn oil and safflower oil. These have very high levels of pro-inflammatory omega-6s. We've absolutely got to do our very best uh, to reduce the levels of omega-6s in the diet and actually favor the omega-3s. Uh, things like uh, a flaxseed oil, for example, fish oil, if if you choose to eat uh, animals. Uh, these are good sources. Algae derived DHA. These are wonderful sources of uh, of good fat. You know, the the word fat carries such negative connotation in our society, and yet it's the most important fuel for humans, along with protein, and always has been. Humans in our two million year history, have never eaten much in the way of carbohydrates. And certainly, we've never had access to gluten. You know, people say, my gosh, it's in the Bible. Give us this bread. Well, that's only 2,000 years ago. How does that compare with two million years of walking the planet when we didn't have grain, we didn't have exposure to gluten? Uh, Talking with Dr. David Perlmutter, who is sharing with us about his amazing book, Grain Brain and what we can do to take care of ourselves to prevent Alzheimer's. He said that Alzheimer's disease is preventable based on the, our lifestyle and especially the food that we eat. And for those of you who, and I especially recommend this, to get his free glycemic index guide, go to drperlmutter.com. There'll be a red pop-up. Put your email in there. You'll be part of his community, which I highly recommend. And you'll get this free book. I have it here. I got it today, and it's excellent. So I just want to recommend that. So, wow. Okay, so what we're talking about is the diet, where we're saying now butter is back. You can eat some fat in your diet, maybe even a lot of good fat. It has to be good fat, protein, healthful fats. Protein is good, right? Well, again, it, it you know, it's a question of quality. And uh, when we see books like Dr. Campbell, uh, the China study that finds statistically those individuals who eat more meat have higher risks for certain diseases, uh, people would be surprised that I would say that he's right. But I do say that he's right because Mm -hmm. those statistics are generated from just looking at people who eat meat compared to those people who don't eat meat. And that's like saying, well, we're going to do a study in terms of the healthful uh, benefits of alcohol, and we're not going to delineate whether that's drinking a glass of red wine or taking a couple of shots of Jack Daniels. It's alcohol. The same thing with meat. Now, by and large, more than 95% of the meat that people eat uh, in Western cultures is grain-fed, high omega mm. what did I say earlier, pro-inflammatory, fe- uh, cattle that have been fed genetically modified foods that have been pounded with antibiotics, and oftentimes uh, factors to help them grow, these are things that you've got to avoid like the plague because they are going to absolutely increase your risk for disease. And one of the, uh, aside from their high content of omega-6 and the concerns over genetic modification, I think let's take a a look for a moment at the potential risk of eating these uh, meats from cattle that have been pounded with antibiotics. It was developed discovered in the late 1940s uh, that when animals are exposed to antibiotics, which they started giving them 
uh, because their living conditions were so atrocious, that they grew fat. And, you know, if you're a cattle, uh, in the cattle, you can find something that will raise, uh, accelerate the growth of your chickens or your or your uh, bulls and cows, my goodness, and pigs, you're going to be interested in that. So understand that about 70% of the antibiotics used in America today are going to uh, to animal husbandry, to cattle and, and poultry to extend, enhance their growth, not in the use in humans. That said, what this is doing is modifying the food that we are eating and in addition, it's changing the bacteria that live in these animals, setting the stage for things like antibiotic resistance. The bottom line is the health of the brain is fundamentally uh, re, uh, related to the health of the gut. The bacteria that live in the gut play a fundamental, a cardinal role in determining the health destiny of the brain. This idea of the brain-gut connection is absolutely profound. Even subtle changes in uh, the diversity and the number of bacteria in the gut have a huge role to play in changing the destiny of the brain. So that said, uh, editors from Harvard and uh, Johns Hopkins have uh, joined on to a new journal, which is called, it's a peer-reviewed medical journal that will debut uh, in January of 2015, it's called Brain and Gut. And hmm. I find that to be very, very exciting. So uh, I'm That's very great. much looking forward to that journal. I'm going to serve as the editor-in-chief. And wow. I'm thrilled about this, that we're finally going to be uh, serve as a, 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 a collection point for researchers, putting out research, demonstrating this beautiful dance that happens between the gut and the brain, what the gut is now called the second brain. And and it's bi-directional, the influence of the brain on the gut as well. So so we're real excited about that. That's tremendous. Okay, well, it's, there have been some questions coming in that I'll get to. I have a personal question myself, but if anybody who's listening, any of our listeners, has a question for Dr. David Perlmutter, author of number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain, please send it now to Kirti, K-I-R-T-I, at Alzheimer's, no, apo- no apostrophe, alzheimerspreventionorg That's Kirti, K-I-R-T-I, at alzheimerspreventionorg and we'll see if we can get your question answered. So, so far, this has been amazing, very insightful, and very helpful. I have a question, personal question, and I'm going to tell you a little story, and because I'd like to make the segue also into gluten, if that's okay with you. Uh, now, on page 16 of your book, you have a little self-assessment. And when I looked at number two, I had to take a step back because, and you're from Florida. I mean, Florida, you know, the, the they have orange juice. And when I'm in Florida, I love orange juice. So it says, I drink fruit juice. And so does that mean that uh, my daily glass of orange juice, or if I'm down in Florida, maybe a little bit more, is hurting my brain if I have orange juice? Yep. That's no, <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. No. Uh, actually, I'm not sorry. I mean, I'm I'm happy to be giving you this information. Uh, a 12 ounce glass of orange juice provides nine teaspoons of sugar. That's 36 grams of carbohydrate. You drink a couple of glasses of orange juice before your bagel or croissant or whole grain cereal arrives, and you have already had uh, 72 grams of carbohydrate just from the fruit juice alone. And when you're so you're Needing to limit your total carb intake to 80 grams a day, you're just about busted by drinking a couple of glasses of orange juice. There's nothing natural about orange juice. Orange juice doesn't hang from a tree. So a better choice would be to eat an orange because then you're going to get a lot of uh, the fibrous material, uh, bioflavonoids. Those things slow the release of the fructose and glucose. But pounding your body with fruit juice, it's the same as drinking a can of cola. Uh, a can of cola has about the same amount of sugar as your glass of orange juice. That's why I'm telling you that's not the right thing to do. Now, right. um, I'm raising a lot of eyebrows, and I know that. And it's time. It's time for people to be put uh, to hear the other side of the story. You know, you watch television, have your fresh orange juice each day. Why? Because it's high in vitamin C. Well, you know, the bottom line is it's not really that high in vitamin C, first of all. And there's no way that whatever vitamin C is in orange juice is in any way going to offset 
of the damaging effects of that massive sugar load that people engage in thinking that they're doing themselves the right thing. They are not. All right, well, thank you. This is Dr. David Perlmutter, author of Grain Brain, number one New York Times bestseller. So we have a question from a, an Italian person who eats pasta, and on your, in your book on page 16 it says eating pasta could be bad for your brain. So how do you answer this uh, Italian who is the, raised uh, on pasta? The time to give it up. And uh, <laughs> whether it's gluten-free pasta or not, pasta has a very high glycemic index. And as such, what the glycemic index talks about and measures, developed at the University of Toronto, it measures not just how quickly your blood sugar rises, but also how long it remains elevated. The, ho- the longer that blood sugar is elevated, the more damaging it becomes. When blood sugar is elevated, it binds to proteins in a process that we call glycation. When you glycate your proteins, when proteins bind to sugar, it dramatically increases inflammation, the cornerstone of brain degeneration. So that's why pasta is not a good choice, whether it's gluten-free or whole grain or wheat uh, pasta or even white pasta. It's absolutely to be avoided. These are foods that are high carbohydrates. Now, I would encourage uh, that individual to go to drperlmutter.com. I'll Mm -hmm. send that person the glycemic index, and they can then read about uh, what how foods are rated according to the Harvard School of Public Health and determine better food choices based upon the glycemic index. It's very important. Okay, well, now let's make a little segue into the concept of gluten. I just want to share a personal story. About three years ago, uh, I had gained weight, and for some reason, I... I went to. I wanted to figure out why it was, and I wanted to get my health back. I decided I was going to put my health first. I went to Canyon Ranch in Florida, in Miami Beach, and they did a a food sensitivity test, and I came out sensitive to gluten. And I don't know if you know Dr. Karen Koffler. She's the medical director there. And, I spoke uh, to her about two weeks ago. Yes. Really? I'm, okay. Uh, uh, I'm a uh, professor at the University of Miami. So. Oh, you uh, are excellent. Yeah, I lecture there a lot. Great. So she said, uh, you know, I decided, met with the nutritionist, I decided no more wheat and and actually dairy as well, some cheese and other things. But the gluten was the big thing. I was plus three to the gluten. And she said, you know, you don't really even have to do anything else. You don't have to exercise unless you want to, and I love to exercise. And you don't have to make too many other changes in your diet. But what you're going to find is when you eliminate gluten from your diet, your body's going to shrink. You'll lose weight, but it won't even, for the amount of weight you're going to lose, you're going to look a lot trimmer. And uh, she was partially right. I did shrink, but I also lost 23, 24 pounds just by eliminating gluten from my diet. So gluten, I think, is a very big risk factor for so many problems that we see in America. And as you're saying now, it's also a big problem for your brain health. Isn't that right? No question about it. And um, again, if people did not see the uh, the show today, the Dr. Oz program, it's free and available beginning 24 hours later. So by tomorrow afternoon, that whole program is going to be posted. And I really, you know, try to do my very best to explain the mechanism whereby gluten is threatening to the brain. Now, um, wonderful work by Dr. Alessio Fasano at Harvard. I've had the unique opportunity to lecture with him. Uh, but his work is demonstrating now some really remarkable things about gluten. Not only does it lead to leakiness of the gut, a leaky gut that lets things into the bloodstream that really shouldn't be there, but he's now demonstrating leakiness of what is called the blood-brain barrier. And that is a a protective barrier that kind of keeps the brain as a sanctuary. And that's exactly what we demonstrated today on the program when we broke the glass covering over the brain. That's the, the, the hot water that broke the glass was representing gluten. So it's it's scary business on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's very empowering because we know that uh, this is a r- real leg up for health, that once you understand this, you can make these changes. And I would caution your listeners to uh, recognize that they need to understand that shopping the gluten-free aisle in the grocery store is not what I'm suggesting. So it's not to gravitate 
towards the gluten-free breads, the gluten-free pastas, the gluten-free cakes and cookies, because you're still pounding your body uh, with carbohydrate. So, you know, the other thing I mentioned today on the program is a concept called neurogenesis. Exactly, and I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. That we have to grow back new brain cells. I mean, that's breathtaking. Uh, You know and I know when we were younger men that we were told... Uh, that was a while ago. We were told that we were given a finite number of brain cells, whatever it was, 100 billion, by the time we were around 18 years of age, and then it was all downhill. And indeed, that's what we observed until science finally r- allowed us to visualize that humans have this process of stem cell, brain cell regeneration that persists throughout our lifetimes. And we can enhance that process. That process is enhanced by something you mentioned earlier that you've really adapted in your life, and that is physical exercise. Aerobic exercise modifies the genes, the DNA expression, that turns on a gene that actually makes a type of of growth hormone for the brain called BDNF. And again, um, with reference to your very first email, this was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a very well-respected a journal, uh, Dr. Uh, Kirk Erickson at the University of Pittsburgh, demonstrated in a one-year study that those individuals who did stretching every day, their mm-hmm. brain memory center, the hippocampus, shrunk. Those individuals who engaged in about 20 minutes of aerobics actually had a 2% increase in size in one year in their brain's memory center, higher levels of this BDNF growth hormone for the brain, and improved memory. What I just said is aerobic exercise does what no pharmaceutical agent could do, and that is leads to improvement in memory and growth of new brain cells. Again, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, January 31st, 2011. Well, great. And one thing I just want to mention here is uh, something in our own research is we found that doing our 12-minute yoga meditation called Kirtan Kriya this was done at UCLA, published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and other journals, is that doing this 12-minute meditation exercise decreased inflammatory markers, in which you're talking about, increased cerebral blood flow, and definitely changed the brain, including reversal of memory loss in people with early uh, cognitive decline. So, and, we're, and I think with the increased blood flow, you might even be able to say neurogenesis, although that wasn't necessarily measured, but other markers of neuroplasticity were. So I think what you're saying is, in addition to nutrition and physical exercise, you know, it takes, like they say, it takes a village. Well, it takes a whole lifestyle. And nutrition is, I think, a major part of that because you eat a lot, don't you? Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, um, it's, a, it's a, what we call a holistic program. And right. uh, well, it looks at all kinds of body, mind, and spirit. And, you know, in uh, in your program, I, I believe people were given a, a meditation program for 11 minutes twice daily for eight weeks. We're not asking a lot. 11 minutes twice daily? Uh, okay, it was to, once a day. It was 12 minutes once a day in that program, oh, in that okay. study. Yeah, uh, that's right. All right. Well, there you go. So we're not asking a lot, and uh, but I'm also asking for 20 minutes of aerobics. Yeah, well, I think it goes together and you feel so good when you do. I mean, that's the amazing thing, you know, people who start on a program like this, it's not difficult to maintain because you feel so much better when you're eating well, you're exercising and you're doing meditation or yoga and meditation. You're definitely a new person. You can totally rejuvenate your body and your brain. And that's, that's uh, uh, you know, people need to get their arms around what you just said, and that is you can rejuvenate your brain. It isn't like we were told. You and I were told it's a one-way street. Drink a beer, right. you lose 20,000 brain cells, and you're, you know. <laughs> I heard you say that. I used to have a coach who would say that in the park. He would say, oh, when you go out and drink a beer tonight, you're going to be losing brain cells. <laughs> well, you know, but fortunately... Uh, for me, that uh, those brain cells can regenerate or we might be having a different conversation or, or possibly no conversation for that matter. But the point is, what a notion that each and every one of your listeners right now is engaged in stem cell therapy. It's happening. Each of you is growing new brain cells in your brain's memory center called the hippocampus. And here's what's really cool. 
you can enhance that process doing meditation, getting aerobic exercise, sunlight, and the omega-3 <clears throat> DHA, as well as vitamin D. All are tied in to increasing levels of this hormone, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and increasing the growth of your brain cells. Now, what is really very uh, exciting about that is just published in the Journal of the American Medical Association on April 20th, I'm holding the article in my hand. Can you hear it? That's the yeah, Journal of the American Medical Association. Here's the article. Serum, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and the risk for dementia. So what oh, they did was wow. they, this is from the Framingham Heart Study. They looked at blood samples of individuals way back in 1992 to 1998. They followed these people for 10 years. Those individuals with the highest level of brain-derived neurotrophic factor had a dramatic, a, 40, a 35% risk reduction for developing dementia. Now, that was just published, I guess, what, two weeks ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Very One conservative of most, journal, yeah. Yeah, and you know what? I didn't see a single news release on this. And I, here, I'm holding it in my hand because they're saying, you know, at the end of the article as well, we're going to have to develop some kind of uh, way to, you know, some medicine that will give you BDNF, and therefore that's, you know, in the future. Oh, All right, yeah. Well, you can raise your BDNF level right now. You can do it by doing aerobic exercise. That was described, as I mentioned, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science article from January of 2011. They measured BDNF levels in these people who exercised, and they went way up, and their memory improved, and their brains grew. What are we waiting for? The reason people don't talk about this on the big scale is because it's not monetizable. You can't own it. All you got to do, folks, is get a pair of sneakers and hit the road. And if you can't do that, get on a stationary bike, get on a treadmill, or move your arms up and down, participate in a meditation program, cut your carbs, eat more good fat, take a DHA supplement, that's an omega-3. These are the keys to not only brain preservation, but growing back your memory center. My goodness, it's, you know, I'm glad we're having this conversation because it, it's really pulling it all together for me, so I guess That's I get a little great. excited about it. And we have about seven or eight questions. So before we go into the questions, um, I want to remind people I'm talking to Dr. Perlmutter, author of number one New York Times bestseller, Grain Brain. Just as a little side here, Yogi Bhajan used to say uh, when he would teach yoga exercises, touch your toes. He said, if you can't touch your toes, touch your ankles. If you can't touch your ankles, touch your knees. If you can't touch your knees, touch your hips. If you can't touch your hips, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Well, you know what? There's a lot to said about that. God bless yeah. you. That's the other part of the story we didn't talk about. Right. So here's some questions coming in. Um, are you? Just it says pro paleo diet. Are you a pro paleo diet person? I think that the, the the fundamentals of the paleo diet are very very sound. You know, by definition, the paleo diet is a very low-carb diet. It's a gluten-free diet, and it allows animal products uh, which give good fats. So uh, okay. I, I'm all in favor of it. But, I mean, it's got to be the paleo diet. And the paleo diet is not a diet that allows you to eat beef from grain-fed, uh, hormone-enriched cattle. Let's be paleo. Let's eat free-range chicken and uh, cattle that get to eat grass and live outdoors. That's as close to paleo as you can get. Now, you know, the point is that our food is far more than the macronutrients of fat, protein, and carbohydrates, and the micronutrients being the vitamins and minerals. Food is information. The food that we consume targets our genome. It's a process called epigenetics. And right. recognize that our genome, our DNA is basically the same as it was 50,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago while we were eating the paleo diet. So we were instructing our genome and need to continue to give the signals to our genome so it will function most appropriately. Hey, eating this way has kept us here for 2 million years. Let's not mess it up. Right. Well, and the other side of the coin, a person also wrote, uh, are you advocating going vegan or vegetarian? Well, I think that's a I great diet. I didn't hear you diet. say that. I think yeah. it's a terrific diet with a couple of caveats. Number one, Make sure you get enough fat, and you can be completely vegan and get fat. Just make sure, I mean, eat fat. Make sure that you're getting, you're eating things like avocado, 
uh, nuts and seeds and uh, extra virgin olive oil. Uh, there is even a DHA, which is fundamentally important for brain health. That's vegetarian, derived from algae. The other two areas that need, or three areas are make sure your vitamin D level blood test is adequate. Make sure your B12 level, do a blood test, is adequate. And make sure you're getting plenty of trace minerals. Lots of vegans eat a lot of uh, legumes, a lot of beans. And beans Mm -hmm. have uh, phytic acid that tends to bind minerals. In our vegan patients that we do nutritional analysis on, we see a lot of uh, mineral deficiencies. So these things are easy to fix with, with nutritional supplements. If a person chooses not to eat animals for whatever reason, that's totally cool. But you've got to make sure you're getting enough of these other things that are important. Good point. All right, here's a great question that just came in from, I think it's Roni. Anyway, she asks, this is a good question, Dr. Promoter. She says, I teach a brain fitness class to seniors in senior living communities. We discuss diet and brain health. Can the damage done from bad diet choices be reversed by following these principles? Uh, Roni, the answer is yes, indeed. Uh, so we are doing the same thing. Uh, you know, we're, we're treating people in their 90s. I wrote a, a, a nice vignette in Grain Brain about a very a woman in her 80s, brought in by her uh, sons uh, who was having some severe cognitive issues, and she had some significant reversal. Uh, not back to perfectly normal, that's for sure. Uh, that you know, in in a lifetime, that's not going to happen. But we definitely see improvements, especially in those individuals who we find to be significantly uh, gluten-sensitive who come off of gluten. But here's what's so beautiful about the brain. It can regenerate, and there's a process called plasticity, which means the brain has this remarkable ability to rewire itself, and that is also mediated by that same growth hormone called BDNF, so the same factors aerobic exercise, which, Roni, I am hopeful is part of your program, uh, as well as DHA, that omega-3, uh, getting some sunshine. These are all factors that are really important in allowing recovery. Excellent. Now, uh, we have a question. I don't have the name of the person, but she wants to know, you mentioned inflammation. So uh, he or she is asking about turmeric for the use uh, uh, for use against inflammation, and if you think that's a good idea, should the person take a powder form or a pill, and also well, the proper dosage. Let, let me say that uh, I think uh, turmeric is uh, very, very powerful. It gets back to um, it gets back to the the idea of epigenetics. So, turmeric modifies a specific gene pathway that leads to increased antioxidant coverage, as well as reduction of inflammation. And uh, this pathway is called the NRF2 pathway. I don't mean to be too technical, but lots of cool things uh, activate the NRF2 pathway, including uh, resveratrol, coffee, green tea, uh, and as mentioned, uh, turmeric. So I'm very fond of turmeric. I think it's uh, a very powerful nutrient. I I use it in a lot of cooking, uh, but I also uh, think that uh, as a capsule, uh, taking it in a capsule form uh, about... Oh, 700 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams a day is perfectly reasonable. I would say that uh, it's good to get uh, a turmeric, if you're using it as a supplement, cut with uh, black pepper extract. If you, if you find products that have black pepper extract, uh, that tends to enhance its absorption and slow its degradation so it lasts a lot longer. So turmeric is a player uh, there's there's a Dr. Cole out there in California. Right, Stephen Cole. Yeah, who's doing a lot of cool work with turmeric in laboratory animals, uh, especially the laboratory model of Alzheimer's disease. All right, well, we still have some questions coming in. Um, uh, an individual writes and wants to know about taking probiotics. What you think about that? Oh, I'm that all help? over probiotics, and uh, there's a bit of a hint there in terms of my next book. Uh, but as oh, we mentioned okay. earlier, the uh, the gut plays a huge role. And when we see individuals who are having significant cognitive issues after being on antibiotics for extended lengths of time to, to prevent getting acne or treat chronic Lyme disease or whatever the reason, it really lets us understand that the gut bacteria play a huge role in reducing inflammation 
reducing permeability or leakiness not only of the gut but of the blood-brain barrier as well. And that said, um, I'll, I'll briefly say that I think ultimately we're going to see studies that demonstrate uh, increased risk of Alzheimer's in individuals who were born by C-section, C- uh, being uh, born by vaginal delivery through the birth canal gives you the right bacteria for the rest of your life. Born by cesarean section, you don't get that inoculation of the good of the good microbes. So I think ultimately we're going to see that. That said, I think there's a very uh, empowering place uh, for good probiotics uh, in in general health and certainly in brain health. Great. I know it. I found it helpful myself. Well, here's an, an interesting question. I think this is quite important. It says, my husband takes 10 milligrams of Crestor a day for high cholesterol. And in your book, you say or you allude to the fact that that might not be good. So what about statins, cholesterol, and brain health? Well, let me just make one point, and that is I am not alluding to anything here. I am absolutely saying clearly uh, that this perversion with lowering cholesterol has got to stop. Um, the the notion that cholesterol is somehow bad for humans is is a big mistake. The reason people think cholesterol is bad is because we have great access to drugs that will lower cholesterol. Uh, not that the statin medications don't do some good. They do. They do reduce risk of recurrent heart attack, for example, in men specifically who've had a heart attack. But they do so not because of any effect upon cholesterol. Statin drugs are actually anti-inflammatory, and as such, there is some benefit to the heart arteries. But it's important for your listeners to understand that cholesterol is a critically important chemical in brain health. It is the precursor from which your body makes vitamin D, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol. It's a fundamental building block of every cell membrane, including brain cells. 25% It 25% of the entire cholesterol in your body is stored in your brain, which is only representing 3% of your body weight. So when we see peer-reviewed science that indicates that those elderly individuals, age 75 or older, who have the highest blood cholesterol levels correlating to a 70% risk reduction for developing dementia, we've got to reframe our understanding of the role of cholesterol in health and recognize that this overzealous, uh, aggressive uh, purview of of cholesterol being something negative and therefore we need to do everything we can to get rid of it, we really need to uh, assess that again. You know, our tonsils are good. We shouldn't be taking our tonsils out. The appendix, for example, stores good bacteria. And taking the appendix out when you happen to be in there doing something else doesn't make any sense. The same thing goes with cholesterol. If you're okay. saying cholesterol is bad, you're saying that either God made a mistake or Mother Nature made a mistake. It's there. It's there in other animals. It's there in humans. It's really important for our health. Well, that could be a book right there. there well, you it go. is in your book, actually. <laughs> So right. the whole chat. I, have a, uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to all these questions. I want to ask a question myself, but here's another question. Uh, somebody asks, are some grains better than others? Well, it's a very good question, and I would say that um, uh, there are some uh, gluten-free grains. You know, grain, by definition, means the seed of grass. And, for example, corn uh, doesn't contain gluten, But more than 80% of corn in America is genetically modified. That's another discussion that we could have. But the other point is that corn and rice, which are non-gluten-containing grains, are still very, very power-packed sources of carbohydrate. So corn chips and rice cakes, while they are gluten-free, are not things that we should be eating because they're going to raise your blood sugar the science that correlates elevated blood sugar to risk for Alzheimer's is very, very clear, and again, uh, in our most well-respected journals. Okay, let's see if we can get three questions in the next four or the five light- minutes. Is this the lightning round? Yeah, this will be the okay. lightning round. <laughs> right, I'd like so to I'll- see if everyone who writes in maybe get get the question answered. Okay, uh, what's the difference between glycemic index and glycemic load, and what's more important? Well, it, it's it, it's a question that's oftentimes um, banded around, and it has to do with uh, a, a standard measurement 
of the food that you're looking at versus um, the um, what might be considered to be, a, for example, a, a typical um, uh, portion. So uh, I would say I would direct that question to uh, the website, drperlman.com. Get the glycemic index because I, I go through that and talk about the glycemic load. Um, so the glycemic oh, I just load opened up to that. I just opened up to that on page 12, so that's on good. On page 12, the glycemic load yeah. is another valuable tool. There you go. So go to drperlmutter.com, and then the little red pop-up comes up. You put your email in there. You're part of his community, and you'll get this excellent uh, booklet that talks about the glycemic index, glycemic load. So I have a question. Um, you sound fantastic. I know you're incredibly busy traveling and speaking and seeing a lot of patients. What are you doing today to stay strong in your own way, in your own self, with such a demanding schedule, and what is your program? Um, well, uh, as I said to you off air, um, I have a, a, a positive family history for Alzheimer's. So I'm doing everything right. I can to keep that from happening uh, in me. And that involves running. Uh, I'm actually right now training for a half marathon, which you know, I, I've been doing for years. Um, I'm on the exact diet that we've talked about tonight. Uh, I um, make sure I get plenty of sleep and I don't push myself too hard. i you know, I, I, I come home uh, by 4.30 in the afternoon and dedicate a, a significant part of my day to intellectual activities, but also to taking care of myself physically because uh, it could be in the cards for me and I choose to uh, I choose a different destiny. That's awesome. So chilling is very important. Intellectual activity, we talked about that. And, uh, you know, you're you're really taking good care of yourself, so you're a great example. And Again, ladies and gentlemen, this book, Grain Brain, uh, by David Perlmutter, is a number one New York Times bestseller, sold about 500,000 copies now, and and uh, I, I really strongly recommend everyone get this book. I have it. I've been reading it, and it's enlightening. It really is. Everyone should read it. And also go to his website, drperlmutter.com, and get your little, uh, go to that sign up there in that red pop-up, pop up and get your glycemic index. So one last question here. Um, funny question to end on, but um, someone wants to know, I don't really understand the question. It's, the question is fat in steak and cheese. If, well, hold on. Great what? question. Uh, and oh, how do you feel about the fat in steak and cheese? Is that good fat or bad fat? Well, I think the big argument over the years has been that cheese and eggs and beef are high in the dreaded saturated fat, right? And I would say that uh, this was recently addressed in the Annals of Internal Medicine in a study looking at over 500,000 individuals. It was just published last month, demonstrating absolutely no correlation between saturated fat consumption and risk for heart disease. Moreover, recognize that the brain loves saturated fat from day one. In fact, 50% of breast milk, is uh, the fat in breast milk, is saturated fat. Wonderful for your health. I talked about it today on Dr. Oz, but what, what I would tell people to do is I did a little video review of saturated fats. Uh, it was published today, actually, on drperlmutter.com. So if they go to, or even Facebook, David Perlmutter, MD, it's right there. Click the arrow, watch the video, learn about saturated fats. I actually quote the article that was just published a couple of weeks ago. These are good foods, cheese, eggs, beef, but you've got to make sure that the sources are appropriate, that the meat you eat is grass-fed, that the eggs are pasture-raised, that the cheese comes from an organic source, like uh, goat's cheese, for example. Keep in mind that if that's not the case, then these fats could be detrimental to your health. All right, one last question, because I, I'll, I'll, then we'll let you go. But this is such a not good a question. You can say yes or no. Have have there been any studies that show that these diet changes and supplements help someone who, who already has Alzheimer's? So that's a great question to end on right there. It is. Uh, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I have been uh, waiting for that study to happen, and fortunately in January of this year it did. Uh, an interventional oh. trial was, was published demonstrating, uh, in fact, that uh, a diet higher in fat and lower in carbs did improve cognitive function in individuals. So we're starting to see traction uh, with our statements about uh, intervention, and uh, it, it's very exciting. And, you know, we predicted that. You, you can predict that. Anything you do that's going to increase brain energetics, 
uh, you know, favor the health of the brain mitochondria, the energy produces in the brain cells, is ultimately going to demonstrate effectiveness. So that's a terrific question. Yes, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. David Perlmutter, for being our guest here on the Healing Zone, the Alzheimer's Prevention Zone, brought to you by the Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. For more exciting programs, please go to www.alzheimersprevention.org. And again, thanks so much to David Perlmutter, Dr. Perlmutter, and make sure you go to his website, drperlmutter.com, to get your free glycemic, glycemic index guide. Dr. Promoter, I can't thank you enough. This has been enlightening and just stimulating and fantastic. So Great. I hope well, to see you, you know very what? soon. You call me again, and I'll be delighted to show up. That's for sure. All right. Thank All you right. very Great. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Goodbye. And thank you, everyone, thank you, everyone. for attending, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. 